Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, you thought you were done with me, <laughs> but I'm back. In all seriousness, it has been an absolutely phenomenal two days. So let's start by taking a look back. Pretty good, eh? I hope you all enjoyed that. I certainly did. But as you know, the Global Cybersecurity Forum is about more than emotion and promotion. The Global Cybersecurity Forum, as we promised at the beginning, is about tangible results. We all agreed that we were going to put together and design a shared action plan and chart our shared priorities. And remarkably, as far as I'm considered, over the last 48 hours, that is exactly what you have done. So, we're going to do some stock taking. And to help us with that, please join me in welcoming back on stage, John Difterius. Yeah, nice good, to, good to see you, John. John and I spent a couple decades together in a previous existence on television. So, John, let's go through some of our shared priorities, uh, beginning with one that I think we can all agree in the room definitely should be on the list. If we can bring up our first shared priority. There we go. Go ahead, John. Well, see, the, the, to advance the cyber resilience of a key sector, uh, we see the achievements of uh, establishment of the new Global Center of Excellence uh, for Operating Technologies for the Energy Sector, something I've covered for uh, three decades, and also the establishment of the following knowledge communities with more than 35 international partners. Uh, one of those is Safeguarding the Future Networks and Emerging Technologies, that's led by STC here in Saudi Arabia, and Securing Industrial Systems for Global Energy Supply, uh, led by Aramco. I know we had some analysis and a quote from Amin Nasser, but if we think of the energy trilemma that we've been talking about here, which is affordability, uh, access to supply, and to making sure that those supplies are sustainable, you can't have an energy system unless it's secure. And we often think about the uh, securing of critical infrastructure in a physical sense. Uh, what we've learned over the last two days, and I think what this action plan talks about, is making sure that it's secure in cyber as well. It's like the second threat, but don't see it as a threat, but see it as an opportunity for securing supply. Absolutely, and that's, it's a topic that came up, for example, in the supply chain uh, panel discussion, real concern about operational technology going forward, something that really hasn't been threatened so far, but is something to keep an eye on. And to that end, you mentioned the chief executive of Aramco. He said today, we know that cyber Threats are rarely localized to one organization or industry. Our collective security requires close collaboration between all stakeholders regionally and globally. Isn't that the truth? Shall we get into number two? Uh, I think so. And this is uh, empower a safe, sustainable, and inclusive uh, cyberspace. What would you suggest are the achievements here? Mr. Well, definitely, Chilcott? again, another knowledge community. So this is now a household term that we're all going to be using, knowledge communities, focus groups, these platforms. 
uh, four of which have already been established. And here we're talking about securing the future of urban living led by NEOM uh, together with a number, I believe it is eight international uh, partners working on that. So that's uh, definitely a huge uh, achievement here, I think, particularly the introduction of eight international partners signing up on that effort. But also, John, if I could point out two global projects which are dear to all of us, one, child protection in cyberspace, and two, women's empowerment in cybersecurity. And this morning I had the honor of moderating or facilitating the uh, Women in Cyber networking event, and I have to say it was extraordinary. And everyone that was in that room had some very concrete ideas uh, about how to continue that in cybersecurity. One out of four jobs in cybersecurity right now uh, taken by women. And as we heard from the former president of Estonia, that number should be in line with you know, gender division, at least two out of four. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, as I described around the opening plenary session, which I think did a terrific job of setting the framework for our discussions uh, over the two days. Uh, Her Excellency Kirsty said, uh, it is important about the importance of women having a greater role in shaping the future of cyberspace, but I think it also plays into what we suggested is the, uh, not the threat, but the opportunity for economic development in cyberspace. Uh, so we've seen female participation in the kingdom at 37%, but it's half out of the economy, and I think it's also very important, which came out of our opening plenary, is to make sure that the education systems are matching the demands from the private and government sectors. Uh, yeah. Another issue that came up during our roundtable with the CEO of SAMI, hmm. uh, Abdul Khalid, uh, in the defense sector, he said that we're already collaborating with universities here uh, in the kingdom, but that has to be a, a nationwide uh, priority for all sectors uh, for training, but it should be a global standard. I think this is what we can do through the global cybersecurity forum itself as a priority for next year. Very interesting. Should I jump into priority three? Go ahead. So priority three, empowering a safe, sustainable, and inclusive cyberspace. So not just those that are contributing to it. No, that was, there we go. Correction. Disincentivizing cybercrime. Uh, and this is something that we heard a lot about, but first maybe, John, if you could talk about the achievements when it comes to this priority that we saw at this uh, Global Cybersecurity sure. Forum. Sure, it was engaging with international partners, including Interpol, to initiate work on uh, disincentivizing uh, cyber crimes themselves. Uh, we heard from Bernard Pelot. Do you want to uh, give us a sense of what he had to say about it himself? Yeah, he said, on cross-border collaboration, I think we need to work together to work in a more organized way. And this idea of collaboration, obviously, we heard over and over that there's just not nearly enough of it uh, if we're going to achieve any kind of results. Well, it's good that you bring that up because when we did uh, the discussion with uh, Sami, we also had the head of the Cyber Authority in uh, Qatar, and he was saying, leading up to the World Cup, it was an amazing deep collaboration within the GCC to share information, but they were working with the international agencies and also, for example, with Interpol, but with the United States, the UK, and those in the ASEAN. Uh, the head of cybersecurity for Malaysia, Dr. Magat, was suggesting we have this great collaboration within the ASEAN community. Can we make that bridge to the Middle East? And I think it circles back to what the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, Abdullah Jaber, said this morning. Uh, the kingdom can serve a very interesting role of being a bridge to Asia, uh, particularly with China, and into Europe as well, and the United States. We know there's competition between the US and China on da data protection and technologies today. And I think another major theme that came out of our sessions the last two days is reaching out to the global south. And again, the Gulf states are great connectors going down to Africa, which is really important. Yeah, and one thing I would add about disincentivizing uh, cybercrime from uh, my panel today with the equivalents from Kuwait and Egypt and Romania, the equivalents of, the, of, uh, of Saudi Arabia's own National Cybersecurity Authority, was that you know, if there is money to be made in cybercrime, then the cybercrime is only going to grow. And we had an interesting debate, which was inconclusive, about whether individuals, not just countries, but whether individuals should be allowed by their, their countries, by their governments, 
to actually pay ransoms. In, in, in any case, it was an inconclusive debate, but we heard a nice uh, little discussion. I'm going to uh, hand number four to you. Do you want to take it? Number four. Safeguarding cyberspace in the era of emerging technologies. Uh, one of the big achievements here on that front, the establishment of the knowledge community, the future of cybersecurity, something that's going to be led, there we go, number four, led by sight. And I think, and I don't know how you feel about this, but you can't talk about emerging technologies nowadays without talking about AI. And I feel like AI was maybe 15, 20% of the conversations here. Any other insights? Well, it's interesting, because you said there was an AI forum in the UK. Yes. Uh, running concurrent, so the collaboration between what's taking place in the UK and in Saudi Arabia with the GCF, I think is also very important. The institute was formed by Royal Decree in 2023. So this becomes its own center of excellence. So I think in GCF 2024, we should build on that and the collaborations in different markets. I thought- And because uh, you mentioned the UK, also in the United States, we had action on AI. Tell us about that. Uh, good point. Uh, President Biden uh, this week signed an executive order on deeper collaboration with the uh, private sector to report more regularly on the testings of AI and what it uh, concludes. And I also singled out in the panel discussion that we had, uh, the first executive order on technology that President Biden signed was actually in May 2021. So four months into office, it was on cybersecurity. I thought the quote that you have, uh, that you've pulled out on the Romanian National Cybersecurity Department is really interesting. It tells yeah. us a lot. Why don't you share it with the audience? Yes, he said technology will always be one step ahead of the regulatory environment. And this is interesting because it goes back to your plenary session where we heard from Jose Manuel Barroso, former uh, president of the European Commission, where he was explaining to all of us that, you know, this is tough work getting this regulation together. It took the European Union, the European Commission, nine years to produce GPRD. So is that going to work when it comes with AI? Well, there are some question marks about that. Well, it's also, but uh, as Excellency Mr. Barroso said, it took nine years for us to build it, but it became a global standard and it was accepted around the world. So that's yeah. what we need to get to here. And they were, and, and from an extraordinary starting point with 1.2 billion people in the European Union. So they already were operating at scale. Okay, this last one is a, a work in progress. And we, we lay it out as number five because it's aspirational. Yes. But it is one that harnesses cyberspace as an engine for growth. Uh, I talked about the globals. Uh, south, uh, Ryan, making sure it's inclusive because viruses and cyber attacks uh, don't know any boundaries. What were your takeaways on that? Well, so one from your interview today with His Excellency Adel al Jubair uh, saying, one country cannot do it alone. Uh, we have to work together. We have to share information. We have to share expertise and experience. Yeah, and again, it goes back to what we talked about, uh, Saudi Arabia, the kingdom through the economic transformation, but being an honest broker, it's the largest economy in the Middle East and North Africa, but serving as a bridge builder to East and West and, and to the South. Uh, Jose Manuel Barroso, I thought was superb on the opening session. He said cybersecurity should be seen as a global public good, but it will always be a very challenging task from a geopolitical point of view. We have to recognize that. We had an honest uh, conversation throughout the last two days uh, on that role. And one other issue we brought up with the former Minister of Foreign Affairs for India, uh, Mr. Cheyenne, he was suggesting that uh, you could look at the G20 as just dealing with economic policy. I think India, with its leadership as the chairman of the G20 this year, was trying to broaden its mandate and can it be a vehicle with Saudi Arabia involved. I saw coming into the GCF 2023 as seeing the expanding BRICS with 11, potentially a threat to the G7, they disagreed with that. Uh, president Barroso, the pre former president of Estonia and the foreign minister of India said it can be actually provide much more cooperation when it comes to cybersecurity and cyberspace. Yeah, and pointing to the um, Saudi Arabia's presidency in 2021, beginning in December of 2020, as being very successful. And so you have uh, the kingdom as uh, not just uh, uh, directing you know, uh, the, the G20, but also now perhaps part of uh, BRICS in a way, and the convener, of course, of the Global Cybersecurity Forum. So you're all wondering right now, how long are Ryan and John gonna go talking <laughs> for? And I guess the quick answer to that is we could talk for a very long time. We got 
<laughs> we made a living out of it. So, uh, well, I guess we should probably leave it at that. I'm, I'm going to leave it to you to close. Oh, he's so going to leave it for me up. to close. Okay. I think what we would like to say to you is that we think that the last two days, uh, if you go back to what we said at the beginning, that just having you all here in this one room, here in Riyadh, in the kingdom, it really underscores the international community's commitment to building a safe and resilient cyberspace. If that was our starting point two days ago, what we've seen over the last 48 hours with all of your contributions, with these achievements and the insights reinforces that. I am convinced that we're moving in the right direction. Of course, all of the work is not done, which is exactly why we're going to reconvene right here, same time next year and continue our work. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Thank this you very much. This has been one heck of a forum.